Eswatini's constitution defines the nation as a democratic, Tingundla-based system of governance. The Tingundla system divides the country into 55 traditional administrative regions. During parliamentary elections, citizens vote for a candidate to represent their Ngundla in the House of Assembly, the lower house of parliament. The king then appoints an additional 10 members at his discretion and also the Speaker of the House to fill the 66 seats available. The upper house or Senate consists of 30 members. 20 of them are appointed by the king. Notably, political parties are unable to compete and are effectively banned in the country. Mswati personally appoints the prime minister, cabinet members and judges. Additionally, he holds the role of Commander-in-Chief over the Defence Force, Police Service and Correctional Services. He further enjoys legal immunity and has the authority to dissolve Parliament at his discretion. King Mswati III, however, describes this system of governance as a monocle democracy and asserts that it embodies the elements of true democracy. Given these considerable powers invested in the monarchy, it is difficult to see traditional democratic norms in the system. However, this would be less of an issue if the people of Eswatini perceived the government as being responsive to their needs and creating a future that is bright for the majority of the population. Resentment against King Mswati III has been brewing for years. The nation of 1.2 million people faces significant economic challenges. A third of its workforce is unemployed and more than half live below the poverty line from lower middle income countries. Adding to the discontent is the stark contrast between the average citizen's lifestyle and the public display of the monarch's wealth. The king's two private jets, fleet of luxury cars, opulent palaces, and this lounge suite made of gold epitomizes the disparity. Ironically, Eswatini receives in excess of 125 million US dollars in development aid from donor countries. Despite decades of repressed and failed calls for a more democratic system of government, the surge in dissent has intensified. In 2021, a law student's murder at the hands of security forces triggered protests. After petitions to the monarchy was prohibited, demonstrations escalated to looting and arson. The monarchy responded by deploying security forces, resulting in the deaths of at least 70 unarmed citizens and more than 250 others injured. A public curfew was imposed. What was unprecedented about the 2021 unrest was both the scale and nature of the movement. It was dominated by young people who openly criticized the royal family, which is something that historically has been almost completely absent from Eswatini politics. SADC deployed two fact-finding missions to Eswatini. The findings of those missions were presented in a report to the king uh, that document has not been made public, so we don't know the recommendations or if the King has begun to institute any of the reforms. Uh, however, what we do know is that at the time, in his capacity as chairperson of the SADC organ, uh, President Ramaphosa met with the King and announced that the Kingdom of Esartini and the SADC Secretariat would work on a terms of reference for a national dialogue forum. Since the 2021 unrest, Eswatini has experienced relative calm. But it appears to be primarily attributed to the government's harsh security crackdown, marked by arrests, torture and assassinations. This was evident in the killing of Tulani Maseko, a prominent pro-democracy activist and human rights lawyer in January of this year. It seems, however, that the king has been dragging his feet on this process and likely has no intention of engaging in a national dialogue forum, which could ultimately see him have to relinquish his um, absolute control of power.